I'm Rollo and I work at YouTube, but more importantly I'd like to introduce my other panelists. Uh, this panel is going to be about YouTube but also about indie developers, how to grow YouTube channels and how the kind of platform works and how it can work for gamers as well. So first off to my left I have Tom, who's from the channel Mashed. Uh, then I've got Mark, or Turks, from Yogcast. And then on the far end I've got Mike from Outside Xbox. Um, so, um, of course, I hope 99% of you are all subscribed to all three channels, but if not, I'd love if you guys could uh, tell everyone a bit about yourself and your channel. Oh, I got, yeah, cool. Um, so my name's Tom, I'm head of channel for MASH. Um, what MASH does, uh, we make kind of animated video game comedy, uh, so that's like satirical pieces of content, really big things like console wars, down to individual parodies of indie games and triple A titles. My name's uh, Mark or Turks, uh, part of the Yogs Cast. We're a family of YouTube channels, about 23 of us. Uh, we make gameplay videos, let's plays, and uh, yeah, we get lost a fair bit. Uh, I'm Mike from Amazon Xbox. We are uh, an Xbox YouTube channel, but like, we've been kind of connected to the Xbox platform for a while. Uh, we do a weekly show called Show the Week, which is kind of a sort of knock about studio type thing. Uh, we're sort of kind of BuzzFeed style list features about games and game culture and things like that. Uh, what's the other to play? So that's a bit of a mix. So I want to get straight into the, the important bits. So um, I want to ask if you guys have worked with developers in the past, big and small, and how you found that, what were the good experiences and what were the bad, and let everyone know how kind of that gets on with you guys. Sure. Um, so we have a really good relationship with a lot of developers, actually. Um, it's, you know, in terms of the big stuff, we all uh, were kind of associated with games and, and Xbox before we started the channel. So that was kind of a, a bit of a leg up, really. But we started the channel when we were doing, you know, 200 views a video. Uh, we were a bit worried everyone was going to forget about us, but actually they were really supportive because we'd sort of established ourselves in like magazines and, you know, my colleague Andy was on Inside Xbox, which some of you may have watched on the Xbox. Um, so that was great, but also what we've seen recently is a, a real sort of rise in the kind of indie game scene, and, uh, and so we've also met a lot more of the kind of independent developers, and those games are coming to Xbox now, so it's been great to chat to those guys, and those those guys, it won't often be a sort of existing relationship, it'll be, they'll come to us on Twitter and say, we really like your channel, or you know, they'll email, email us, and uh, we'll get in contact with them, but we're kind of, you know, we're not like YouTubers who focus on Call of Duty, or, you know, Minecraft, or, or whatever, really. So we're always happy to try try a game if it's uh, it's fun and entertaining. Uh, so we don't uh, play games we don't like. So basically, we get sent a lot of games. If we like them, then we're likely to play them. I, I should talk, I, I wear another hat uh, for a new company called Keymailer, where we basically allow developers to connect directly to YouTubers. It's quite hard to get in touch with a lot of YouTubers. They're quite ethereal beings, they don't tend to have offices or, or emails that they check. Uh, so we're launching a site sometime next week, I think, uh, keymailer.co. Uh, you can sign up over there, and uh, the idea behind that is it's relevant games, getting them out to the right people to play your game. In terms of the Yogs cast, you know, we're, we're very fortunate because of our size and our scale uh, that we can work with a lot of different developers, big and small. Uh, we're still playing the YouTube game like everyone else, so we want to find the next big thing. We want to play really fun, interesting new games. So we have a couple of people whose job is pretty much just playing games and trying to test them out and seeing you know, what we should be playing next. So in terms of like companies we started working with, I mean the channel kind of started only in March uh, last year uh, and a lot of our content is animation and kind of slightly satirical so we had to create content first about the video games for the companies to come. Um, but in the last year that we've done that, um, one of our cartoons I know has been watched uh, at Sony HQ uh, in kind of Melbourne, London, Japan. Uh, we've been working kind of like guerrilla style with Playtonic. Uh, ukulele uh, so we made a short about that um, and we've also done some other stuff where Bungie kind of got in touch and asked us to feature a number of clips that we made about Destiny now like the rationale behind that was we wanted to create content that would be noticed by those companies in the hope that they would then start contact contacting us directly uh, and that's something that's starting to happen now but 
we've signed NDAs with all of them, so I can't talk yet, but soon, I promise. Um, just going back to what Tom was saying, um, one of the things I've noticed over the course of what's running outside Xbox is that a lot of even quite big companies are quite happy for you to kind of take the mickey a little bit and not, not be too sort of... So, you know, I don't think Match would work a bit if, you know, a company was like, stop making fun of our, our game, but actually we're able to throw jokes in about stuff, and when we're doing Let's Plays, we'll, you know, we'll gently make fun of, of stuff that's a little bit silly, um, but it always comes from a place where, you know, we love games and we... I think the key is that if, and again it goes back to what Mark's saying, we tend to play stuff we like, and if we're having fun, that's that's the best possible, like, advertisement for your game, is if people are playing it and having a really, really good time. Yeah, I mean, just to echo on that, um, I think a lot of developers do understand that we know our audience best. We know what people enjoy from our channel. There's so many channels out there that you guys tend to gravitate towards the YouTubers that talk about games in the way you want to have them talked about. So uh, pretty much all the developers understand that it's best just to leave it up to us and uh, it'll work. You know, the spikes you see in terms of sales, from YouTubers playing your games is obscene. Uh, so it is one of those things where even now game developers, and I know a lot of indies are making games specifically with the aim of trying to get people to play on YouTube. Uh, and it's a great way to, to spread the word. Can I ask about your own company? Can you tell us a little more and also how it kind of works? Yeah, so basically um, Keymailer is, uh, it's opening in beta soon, uh, next week we're going to say, or, or thereabouts. You can sign up over at keymailer.co. Uh, the idea is you pair up all of your accounts and it will kind of allow the game developers and publishers uh, to know who you are without knowing who you are, and so they'll be able to target games effectively to you. So hopefully it reduces the spam and the waste, um, and really just makes it easy for developers to get the games into the hands of the YouTubers, and easy for the YouTubers to get the games that they want, because again, a lot of the big guys are still just guys in their bedrooms, and so they don't know who the PR manager or marketing guy is at the big company, or this indie game that they love, but how the heck do I get in touch with that person? So the idea is it acts as the platform to connect with developers and the gamers, uh, and uh, we're, we're really kind of keen, we're really pleased with what's been built, and uh, I feel like uh, Steve Jobs, I can't wait for you guys to see it, it's really something special. Uh, but no, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hopefully really you know, professionalise the industry somewhat, uh, and just help a lot of people get their game seen by the right people. So that definitely wasn't planned. That's the first time I've heard about it and I'm just really interested. Um, so, okay, that's going to be incredible, but are there any tips you can give in terms of if you are indie developing, you want to get in contact, is there a great way to do it? And are there lots of pitfalls to avoid in terms of trying to get in contact with a YouTuber? I think what Mike was saying about like YouTubers don't tend to check email and you know if they're popular, uh, if you tweet at them, you're going to end up with you know lost in the kind of uh, you know a giant mass of uh, sort of at, at replies and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it can be quite tough. Um, most YouTubers do tend to have like a business email address, which is on their Twitter profiles. So that's usually the best place to go. They might not check it all the time, but uh, it's it can be really tough. You know, the bigger they are, and those are the guys who want you know featuring your stuff, uh, the harder it can be to get into contact. I would say be persistent without being annoying. Um, if you can, you know, if, if you're an indie developer and you want to get a hold of a YouTuber, you know, send them an email. If you don't hear anything back in a couple of weeks, you know, then, then give them another another nudge and see how you get on. Um, and, and that's really the best bet, to be honest. I mean, it, it can be tough because there's no centralised place yet. There you go, Terps, helping you out here. Uh, for people to get access to those users. I'd also just personally say that sometimes it's best to aim a little lower. There are lots of channels out there with 10, 20,000 subscribers who might really want to play with games and that's still a great way to reach lots of YouTube audience. Yeah, it's really hard to find those gamers, you know, to, to those smaller channels, but relevance is key when you want to get your game played. Don't go to PewDiePie because he's got a billion you know, subscribers if your game isn't one that he should be playing. You want to find those real brand ambassadors, those, if you've got an RTS game, find the biggest RTS guy out there and just, you know, keep at it and hope, but, or just wait a week, keymailer.co. Um, yeah. But, uh, past that, it is all about relevance. It's not about numbers of views. You want to hit the right people with the right game. 
Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, there are other approaches that we take that have been quite successful. We try and approach like YouTubers from multiple ways. So one way is to check out if they're affiliated to an MCN and go through the MCN. You know, MCNs are obviously kind of really focused on the development of business kind of side of things for their YouTubers. And quite often they can get through these doors that seem kind of like totally jammed up. Um, there are other kind of third party tools as well that are quite helpful. There's a tool called Tubular, um, which is a third party analytics tool, but it kind of splits YouTubers into certain specifics from gaming and further in as well, you know, so you can kind of come at them multiple ways. But I definitely agree with what these guys are saying that a lot of these guys, they're really focused on YouTube, they're super creative, they don't always operate to a normal office schedule, so just kind of keep on going for them. I mean, I've sometimes used the picture of uh, Pussing Boots looking sad from Shrek, and that is what has got me responses from sometimes really big YouTubers as well. So try and kind of try and catch their attention, try and be amusing in some way, you know, it doesn't always need to be dry. Sometimes if you can make somebody laugh, you know, you're really kind of like upping the chance of them getting back to you. I work at YouTube and I find I can't get in contact with you as well, so... Um, I return your call. Well, you do. I'm very happy about that. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, live streaming. Um, and obviously the whole UGX is being live streamed now on their channel. I want to ask, do you guys live stream? How often? What do you think about it? And how, how do you do it? Uh, yeah, so I, I personally live stream uh, three times a week. Um, I, I play Hearthstone exceptionally badly. Uh, and uh, that's on a, on a different platform. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, guys who are on, on YouTube gaming and uh, across the Oddscast family we, we clock up uh, you know, millions and millions of minutes watched on, on streaming and as a viewer we're seeing it more and more people want that live experience to interact with the creator and you know type in the chat and then see them read it and respond that's a fantastic feeling as an audience and it's, it's a completely different thing to YouTube uh, it's very intimate it's very gone uh, kind of Gonzo and there's no editing involved. That's why I love it because you just sit down, you play games. It's the most authentic let's play type style out there. Uh, but it isn't necessarily the most refined uh, piece of content at the end of the day. When things go wrong, everyone shares in the experience of everything going wrong. Uh, but for me, it's great. I get to find out because of the delay of chat that I, I, you know, I miss lethal in Hearthstone after I've done it wrong, and you know that I should have done this thing, but it's too late for me. So. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think live streaming is one of those things that is growing and growing and just really just as more and more people out there have devices that are capable of watching content they want to watch, it just opens up these worlds to them. Uh, and if you haven't tried the YouTube gaming app, grab it, it is amazing. It is, it's what I use to digest YouTube now rather than the YouTube app. Um, it's a much nicer experience to enjoy games. You can browse via games themselves really easily and that can be really great at discovering new YouTubers. If you want to, you know, see just right Rocket League videos, you can go and click on Rocket League and it serves them all up. You can see who's playing live, who else is there. And it's a great way if you've got an interest in the game to just find new voices. It's not something we've done a lot of. Uh, so when the Xbox One launched, we did a six hour live stream from the YouTube space, which is this kind of studio in London, uh, which if you have, is it over 10,000? 5,000. 5,000, wow, okay. I'm coming into space. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's the place where you can go. So we did a, a six hour live stream and it was, a, it was a real challenge but because it was the launch of the console we had a ton of stuff to cover, so loads of games to play and things like that. It was great fun. Um, it's, very, it's very much a different discipline and, and not one that we've, I would say, really got our head around yet but it's definitely one that we're, we're interested in. But I think, yeah, the, the challenges of the live stream are, like you say, you know, keeping things entertaining without that kind of editing to condense things. We like to just cut out the funny bits where we're funny and the rest of the time where we're just dying constantly or whatever. That's, that's the stuff we kind of stick in the, in the trash. Can. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real talent. You see these guys who are streamers rather than YouTubers, and they're brilliant. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing to us, and it, it feels like something that we could be good at, but there's definitely a sort of learning process. But obviously, having things like YouTube gaming. The idea that I, I think previously the reason we kind of shied away from it was we, we've got a big new uh, YouTube audience. We don't have any real audience on Twitch, so it's sort of a, you know, getting people to discover a live stream would have been quite difficult, but now, because of the gaming app and it, it favours live streams, so you can see when your favourite channels are live streaming. That makes it much more compelling for us because we know people can discover that, that live stream. Um, so it's definitely things we're looking into. We've been doing some great stuff on the YouTube stage and we will be up there again at 5pm with PlayStation Access, another great uh, YouTube channel. Um, so 
so yeah, really, really enjoying it. It's just about getting our heads around it and finding the time as well. You know, it's kind of we, we, we're sort of full speed on the on the YouTube channel and, and finding that time to then do live stream as well is it, tough. What I just add there is we're, we're live. It's great, as you said, because it uh, you're there. It's done. There's no editing. At the same time, online now people are starting to accept. That if you upload an hour as live stream as for well, they still enjoy it. So it's like you've got double value there. I was just going to say, I mean, we focus pretty much on cartoons, that's our output, it's animation, and obviously animation is uh, it's a very kind of like time intensive and labor consuming kind of, you know, job, it really is. Um, and what you see in, at the end is often maybe six, seven iterations away from how it first started. So we've been focusing really on, on that because that's what our audience comes to the channel for. But, you know, we, we literally, I don't think we could make more cartoons than what we make now. We're looking for ways to kind of like, you know, increase our, our our upload times, you know, and our regular uploads, and I think streaming is something that we're, we're looking to get into, but at the moment we're just peering in, uh, watching the people who do it very well, and hoping, like, young Jedis, we can learn. I, I, I think I would love to see you create an animation, and that's the great thing about live streaming, is you guys can be working on stuff, and it's tricky when you've got NDAs and lead times and things change, but I think see behind the curtain is kind of what live streaming does with a lot of existing YouTube present, uh, talent. Um, and beyond that, it, it's, it's more accessible, I think, than YouTube because if you're a gamer out there, you can live stream. That's all you need to do. You don't need to have an edit software. You don't need to know about non-linear editing. You haven't got to worry about too much in terms of production quality. Um, it's just about being engaging and funny or entertaining or whatever it is. Really good at games for some people. Um, and uh, just, you know, you can find an audience. And so that's really cool. I mean, you're totally right. Uh, in fact, a lot of our animators do live stream via uh, their own channels. But that's YouTube. For us, like with Match, obviously we're kind of like a loose collaboration, uh, working with a load of bunch of animators. So we have no central hub. You know, these guys can't live stream through our channel. So quite often, when they do live stream, uh, we ask them to kind of mention us, and kind of mention us for our channel, and kind of like direct viewers. You should give them your stream key. You should just let them do it. Just uh, let yeah. them do it. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the cool things. You can just now push the live yeah. stream to any channel and share it. It's really dangerous. Yeah, uh, it, don't get yeah, it's the up on my stream key on the side there now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really, and it's, it's, it's a great way. Every year uh, during December, we do our charity live streams. So we've raised about uh, 3 million uh, quid over the past four years for charity. And it's through just playing games all day, really, uh, throughout December. And then partnering up with great people, uh, great developers support us with the Humble Bundle uh, alongside it. And it makes such a huge difference. But that engagement of having the live stream and, and being told to donate, it's so much more effective as a, as a drive call to action than just putting up YouTube videos was. So it, there's a lesson there for people who want to you know, push other products other than charity, that the engagement and investment through live streaming seems to be really, really strong. And there are now a as well. So, oh, yeah. yay! Yay, a now. Cool. Um, cool. I was going to ask, um, you guys obviously grown your chance to really large numbers. You've done it very quickly since March. Um, when it comes to it, there's a cliche, content is king, but I'm wondering what proportion you think is great video, but also the optimization, and the strategy, and the work you put behind the channel. Um, our, our approach, you know, you're not heard of maybe SEO, right? Search engine optimization, which is basically when you, uh, you try and work out what you're searching for and you make sure that your video is titled with that stuff. We don't completely ignore it. I mean, obviously, we try and make sure people can find our stuff, but actually, for us, uh, the way we've done really, really well is having just titles people who want to click on and, and cool thumbnails. That's that's the basis of uh, outside Xbox's success. Is just you know those videos that pop up on the side in YouTube. That's what you know. If people spot something they want to click on, they'll click on it. And we find that's a bit more reliable because we it's a bit more like psychology than trying to game a system. And you know if you try and game a system, they always change the system. You know you guys with your sneaky engineers can just change it, right? So so we decided we would try and sort of hack the human brain instead. Um, but we make, we make the kind of stuff we want to watch, right? Uh, you know, we make the kind of stuff we want to watch. People accuse us of kind of clickbait titles every so often, but there's a, there's a real difference between clickbait up there for me is a title that promises one thing and then doesn't deliver. Whereas our titles are exciting and interesting and intriguing. And then hopefully when you watch the video, that video 
delivers on what, on what you clicked on. Um, so, so that's been it for us, and, and those videos continue to do well, you know, years, years on, uh, basically. So we've never had, um, I know a lot of YouTubers have done this kind of thing where they've had like one big viral success that's driven a ton of subscribers. You know, they made one video that did 20 million views and they got a ton of subscribers who then all like watched a couple of videos and then, you know, disappeared. You know? For us, it's been a much more gradual, sort of steady thing, but uh, we were persistent, we were trying to maintain a like high level of quality, uh, and that seems to have paid off now. We recently hit a million subscribers, which is an insane uh, Thank you. Um, an insane number. I try and imagine what a million people looks like, and it is it's mind boggling. Um, so, yeah, it proves that you don't necessarily need to have just one viral, like, lucky breakout sort of hit. If you just keep at it and keep consistent, if you're a, an aspiring YouTuber, that is a way to do it. But it, it's taken us three years. Like, it's, it's a real sort of the, the grind, as they call it. Yeah, I mean, we just uh, earlier this week hit six billion views across our network, yeah, 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 yeah. which is obscene. And uh, you shouldn't count me, I didn't, they're, none of those are mine. Um, but, well, maybe a couple. Uh, but it, it's, it's, a, it's just this portal to reach people that's just been so ethereal before, and it's, it's here. Um, I, I put down our success to um, being at the right place, right time. Uh, we had uh, a show back when Minecraft, uh, when, sorry, YouTube had shows called Minecraft, and it used to be returned at the top of the search results. Uh, Minecraft was quite a popular search result for many years, um, and it definitely helped introduce us to a lot of people. Uh, what we discovered though is, is people seeing your content is the first battle, but watching it and enjoying it and then returning for future content, that's, that's what you really need to concentrate on. Once you get that audience coming back, you start to build retention and watch time and then YouTube puts more of your videos in front of those people because they think, hey, you're quite good, you seem to work with this guy, so here's more of their stuff. And so you kind of feed the beast that way. Um, SEO is really important, it does help. Um, I think what Mike's chatting about, you know, having attractive thumbnails, titles that are interesting. Um, I mean, I don't know if anyone here watches Vsauce, but I'm addicted to it. And uh, it just, I mean, they, they have stuff like like, you know, what does a shadow weigh? It's like, oh, wow, I don't, I don't know. I, you know. I'm gonna click it though, find out. Um, I don't understand any of the videos, but I enjoy it. And I think that trying to pose those questions or make something that's exciting and just inviting people into your content is, is definitely a worthwhile activity. I mean, when we first started off, SEO was very important for us. You know, we had a very small audience, and you know, we used that to help get us in there. And whenever we launch clips, you know, everything that we put out is kind of goes through a filter, you know, down to title, character length, metadata, description, uh, suggested videos, and like SEO is definitely important. But I think the thing to remember is it's like incredibly competitive place. You know, there are entire businesses built just on providing SEO services to game devs and any else who wants to push their name up. So I would say you use that and you enhance your chances, but it's in no way a guarantee of success. And I think what you want to do is you want to be like maybe in the right place at the right time, which is helpful. But I think really what you want to do is you want to be unique in some way. Maybe that's the personality you have and the character in terms of, you know, when you present the videos. Maybe that's the nature of the content that you make or the people that you work with. Um, there are other things that you can do as well. Like one thing that we always try and focus on doing is, you know, we kind of grade our clips and we try and have a real big clip every month and that acts as kind of like, you know, um, like a honey trap, almost. You know, that's the thing that we put a lot of the money behind, that's the thing that we really want people to see. And when we do that, we bring people in and then you introduce them to content maybe by smaller creators or it's a little bit shorter or experimental. Um, so yeah, I think there is no single way to success. I think it's a combination of all of those things and I think you can never stand still. You always need to assess yourself. We go through our analytics and data monthly, you know, what does well, what doesn't do well, we try and kind of build on that. Uh, but the last thing I would say is we never rely solely on data. I think if you rely just on analytics and SEO, you're in danger of losing your soul as a YouTuber. Uh, and you kind of got to do what you've got to enjoy. Uh, sorry, you've got to do what you do enjoy. Uh, and if you don't, it will show and, and your content won't perform. Yeah, I think analytics will ruin your life though. I, every morning I wake up and I'm in the creator app going, what have you done? What, you know, reading, reading all the stats and stuff. But um, it, it, we have a, a, an example that like reflects that, which is we have a show called Show of the Week, which is every single Friday. We've been doing it since we started Outside Xbox. And it used to be like, they were basically our lowest performing videos because they were not SEO at all. You know, the start of the, so the title of your video is quite important for SEO. And the title
that was just show of the week, um, which is no one's searching for that, um, obviously. Um, so it used to do really, really badly, but we really enjoy doing it. It's a really nice way of introducing people to our personalities and our sense of humour and things like that. So we just kept doing it. We're doing it weekly, basically with like the odd week off, but basically every single week for three years. And now what we're seeing is that's the stuff the subscribers really love because it's our it's our their way of really sort of getting in contact with us. And so we have like a feedback section where we answer comments on the show, um, which is a lovely bit of like interaction with our like awesome community. Like we have a great like our comments are amazing. Um, so as we've gone on, those videos are now some of our more popular ones, and they do better than some of our Let's Plays, which would have been our sort of big SEO wins previously. So it's that kind of thing where, like you say, you know, analytics are important, and it's always good to, you know, kind of, if a video does really well, look at it, try and, even if you don't know for sure, try and work out some reason why that might be, and see if you can replicate it, and, you know, play around with, with what you're doing. Um, but keep doing what you love as well, and, you know, if you're confident that something's good, we spend more time writing and filming show of the week than on any other video on the channel, uh, people will come around to it and they'll probably like it. If you like it, you think it's really cool. Once people start to discover it and you get more of an audience, they'll probably love it too. So, so analysts, analytics can bog you down, but if you guys were to look at one stat that you like look at most in terms of measuring success, or something someone starting out should look out for, what kind of stats would you want to pick out? Uh, monthly revenue. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, there's this lovely thing in YouTube that shows an engagement graph, and so you'll see when someone stops watching a video, or if there's a big spike where people have re-watched a bit, or maybe they linked a bit and it got shared around, and I, I love that because you kind of see, you, you can really drill down into what was the special thing in that video, or, or what worked, and so we, we did a, a live action D&D series, and I love looking at the graph because you can just see all these little spikes, and it was every time we dropped in an animation, and basically people would then go back and they'd watch the animation again. And it meant that when we did the second series of that, we like doubled the number of animations. It meant that it took like a year to come out, uh, but we were we made sure to kind of invest in the area we felt people enjoyed the most. So I really like that, and it's, it's so visual and it's so easy to understand. And it's uh, it's weird. It's like being inside like your audience's brain. It's like oh, they really didn't like that joke. Whoa! But they did like that pretty picture. So more pretty pictures, none of those jokes. Gosh, but well, uh, going back to what I was saying before, because uh, obviously the engagement stuff is amazing, I probably would have picked that had you not been first. Uh, the other one I really like is that I would say about suggested video is like a real time plus. So 40% of our views come from suggested video, which is like a really, really cool number. And although we've got you know great views from subs and, and from you know SEO and you know, people linking in, I really like that our, our high suggested video stat means that we're doing something right with those titles and thumbnails. We're producing stuff that people actually want to click on. If they see it, you know, we it's, it's not quite in the lap of the gods, but it's quite a lot in the lap of the gods when they see that thing pop up in the suggested video. But we feel really good about the fact that when people do see it, they tend to click on it and they'll, they'll watch it. And then they maybe watch another one of our videos because they get served up more of our videos than suggested videos. So for us, that sounds really important because uh, for me, it's a reflection of the fact that we are making content that people would want to watch if they knew it existed. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like, suggested videos for us is generally helpful. We've got figures a little bit higher than that in the green. And I think that's incredible. I think retention, obviously, which is kind of what you're talking about anyway, but how long are people watching your video for, you know? Uh, I think if you're kind of like under 70%, go back to that video and have a rethink maybe about what you want to do with it. I think another thing that we look at is kind of like active monthly users. Uh, you go to some channels and they have a staggering amount of subscribers. But if you actually look at how many of those subscribers are returning each month, sometimes it, it's, you know, a call and maybe below and what that says to me is sometimes that, that channel has done fantastically well but maybe you know the, the content release schedule has been reduced maybe they're not kind of just quite as excited about their channel as they were you know running a youtube channel is incredibly intense job it's not nine to five it's 24 hours a day i mean i've like you know briefed vo guys at four in the morning um you know i, I deal with people kind of like globally you know and trying to measure those things is quite difficult um i think views are obviously important but yeah I think views and, and subs are, are like byproducts of, of excellent videos with good attention and yeah, that's what I would say. And also how engaged is your community? How many comments are they making? How much are they talking to you and talking to each other? Uh, and they're like real barometers of success, for us anyway. Uh, all of those are perfect. Uh, there, there is one thing one of my top creators does which is really clever. Um, they'll divide his subscribers by a thousand views and it will then show on each video a, a ratio for that video, how many subs have got per 1,000 views. And so instead of just looking at the video and be like, I got 300 subs, 
from that one video, great. We can then compare how it's doing against views, which can be quite useful. Um, moving away from numbers, do you have a guilty pleasure on YouTube? Is there something you're really embarrassed that you love? Uh, I got in uh, a YouTube poll uh, about two weeks ago of the EA Sports guy. Uh, and basically, um, I don't know if you know the EA, but it's EA Sports. It's in the game. Uh, and basically, this guy goes to conventions, people recognize him, and basically, they want to do a video with him. And every single video is exactly the same. Because I assume he suggests it. And he's like, why don't you give it a go first and I'll do it. So they're like, EA Sports, it's in the game. And he's like, oh, that's cute. EA Sports, it's in the game. And I, I could watch that for years. And it then just then you click on the next one, same thing again. It's only on YouTube. You would never see that broadcast anywhere else. And yet, that speaks to my soul. I love that. I think you need to meet him because the sound as good. That would be a good meter. My guilty pleasure is Selena Gomez's Vivo channel. <laughs> That's really guilty. <laughs> I don't know if I have a guilty pleasure, but I mean, the thing that I've been addicted to at the moment are all the John Cena vines, so my compilations and stuff, you know, and like, it all started off, I don't know if you've seen the original video, which is a prank phone call, which if you haven't seen it, like, I beg you to go and find it, like, right now, after this session, then you can come and thank me for showing you something so glorious. Uh, but yeah, all of those, like, I think there was RKO's before that, John Cena. Yeah, uh, it's it's so stupid, but you just can't not love it. We got a, 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 was it the Brits when she fell and the, the, the cane. Yeah. Um, so yeah, moving on from fun. What about talk about a little bit about money? So I won't ask any hard questions here, so I have points. Uh, the one thing people ask and we sometimes notice is how do you find your audience reacts to when you said the video is sponsored by X? Yeah, I think it's it's one of those things that is becoming more accepted because it's becoming more known and more declared, and I think that's really good. Uh, YouTube was a bit of a wild west, mainly because again, it's people in their bedrooms who don't know the law or don't understand quite how to disclaim content. Uh, but as it's kind of being clearer in terms of, oh, I get that, that really cool thing was supported by a budget. That's really interesting. Um, for the most part, it's it's when it's not genuine is when you get the backlash. When it is done for money and less so that I lucked out, I got paid to do that. That's amazing. Idiots. They should have done that anyway. Um, and so I, I think it's definitely it's an evolving thing and as audiences understand that you know you're not selling out because it's your job. So you're getting paid to do your job, that's okay, surely. Uh, but as long as you're authentic and you disclaim it, I think everyone's kind of happy and understands it. And really our kind of big goal, as always we only play games we like, but if we're getting paid to cover a game, we try and invest as much of that budget back into the content to really kind of show off how cool it is. So, uh, you know, we did an amazing video for um, Heroes and Generals uh, last year, and we literally had a World War II Sherman tank, uh, we had explosions and gunfights, and it was all for a free-to-play online game, and we did it all, and uh, we, we crashed their servers, it was terrible. I mean, they loved it, but, you know, you couldn't play the game for two weeks because everyone was trying to play the game. Uh, so it, it, they still work and it doesn't have to be a, a, a dirty thing, it's just a question of making sure that the reason you're doing it isn't 100% because of the money. Um, I'm just not really naive, but we haven't actually done any promotional video stuff on our channel yet. Um, it may happen, it's not something we're like actively chasing, uh, but what I, do, I would like to say is that there are now sort of hard and fast rules like by the Advertising Standards Agency, so I think YouTube is definitely becoming a more honest place, and those people who were less honest about what they were doing, you know, it's going to be a lot clearer to the audience, which I think is the important thing. I, I think promotional content's fine as long as you are fully aware that it, it is, a, a, you know, promotional piece of content. And I think the other thing to say is, I, I think uh, what Terms was saying is that, you know, the audience is pretty smart and they'll know if your heart's not in it. You know, if you're just going through the motions and playing some dreadful game you've been paid to play, I think they can tell, probably. Um, but yeah, I think that there's, a, there's a real sort of sense of honesty. I'll tell you what though, it hasn't stopped people thinking that we're funded by uh, Xbox, right? So we very foolishly, clearly, uh, set up a just Xbox um, YouTube channel. And so now everyone thinks we're, we're funded by Xbox. They must have missed all those videos where we were a bit rude about the launch of the Xbox One. Um, you think they went outside with Sigma? Well, yeah, yeah, you would have thought that, but no, a lot of people are like, these guys, Microsoft employees, and like, just, I can show you a video where they're extremely rude about the Xbox, but they seem to have sorted that stuff out.
Yeah, we've actually also been tarred with funded by Microsoft Rush. Uh, we did uh, Xbox, uh, Xbox One versus PS4 rap battle. Uh, and just at the end for a joke, we had Dodge shoot the PS4. Uh, and like, they are still arguing about it right now. Uh, and we are still being accused of taking money from Microsoft. And I would love some money from Microsoft. If anybody works for Microsoft in here, please come and speak to me afterwards and we can talk. Um, but in terms of what these guys are saying, I've got nothing else to add. You're, you know, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be up front if you're doing promotional content. I think if you're honest and it's obvious that you, you, you're saying that to your audience and they, they support you, you know, they will back you. I think it's only when you try and do stuff guerrilla style, or like they say, when it's obviously a bit of promotional content and you try and make out like it's real, that's when you're in real risk of getting burned. Uh, and I know lots of YouTubers who are very wary of promotional stuff and have lots of kind of terms before they agree to do stuff because it's very easy to kind of like suffer from long-term damage for what is normally kind of a short-term game. Yeah, I think, you know, um, fundamentally people watch YouTube channels because they trust the people that they're watching. And I think, you know, the, there'll be guys who, who sort of abuse that trust and, and probably, you know, like you say, suffered long-term damage. Because, well, you know, the great thing about YouTube is it's, it, it democratizes making videos about video games. Right? It used to be the case that you could only watch videos like IGN and GameSpot and like these big, big sort of multinational corporations. Now you can find someone that you, are, who has the same taste as you, same sense of humor as you, and you can trust them and they can be sitting in their bedroom anywhere in the world and telling you about video games. And if you trust them, that's great. If you abuse that trust, then you're in real trouble as a YouTuber because you'll lose that audience. And if they never trust you again, then they just going to stop watching your stuff. So, you know, it makes sense to be open and honest with your audience at all times. Okay, so with uh, you know, losing trust, have you ever got to a stage where you made a video which you just can't upload but you wish you could? So it's either controversial... So, um, we have a video, part of a brand deal, um, that basically... Um, the developers backed out of, uh, and it was for a Star Wars iOS game. And uh, basically, I get told all the time that I'm basically Ricky Gervais. So um, we we made a, a version of The Office in our office uh, where I was running like a Star Wars day, um, and it is my favourite video we've ever made. Uh, but we can't put it out because of the uh, you know we we were building it under the assumption it was part of a paid thing. It's not. So it's a real shame because I love it, and it's uh, you know I'm trying now to get them to commission a whole series of me being Ricky Gervais, but I don't think they're going to go for it. It's a shame, really. I think everything we've ever uploaded has gone live, and I, there are definitely some videos from the early days that I'd rather delete. Um, so I guess it, it ties into the fact that you know uh, if you were again any aspiring YouTubers out there, you know when you start out you won't really know what you're doing, uh, and you'll be terrible on camera. And you know, you'll, you'll, you won't be able to write funny jokes, or if you have written funny jokes, you won't be able to deliver them without sounding really smug. Um, but actually, as you go on, you will improve, and it's it's one of those things where you only ever improve by by doing it and trying. And, I, and you know, whenever people ask me, you know, I, I want to be a YouTuber, what, what should I do? I'm just like, just make stuff and just keep throwing it out there. And you know, it's and I love stuff like when PewDiePie goes back and watches his old videos, and it's like, oh my god, I can't believe I said that. You know, I'm so boring, blah blah blah. But his his style, you know, more. That a lot of people has, has really evolved into what it is today from a kind of far more low-key, you know, uh, exactly how I was when I started and, and you know, how most YouTubers are. You know, no one starts this as a pro, you know, you, you learn from, from doing this. Yeah, with that, one of the main things we always find with small channels are about to grow, it comes down to personality. If you're just playing a game, barely speaking, just playing a game and speaking a little bit, it comes down to being a personality and obviously these guys are definitely that. One thing I'm really excited about personally is virtual reality. Uh, we've got so many different models around. What are you guys looking forward to virtual reality? It's really frustrating from a, from a YouTube and streaming perspective because it's like trying to sell HD TVs with standard depth. Is really all it is is me looking like an idiot wearing a big pair of goggles, which is funny to some, but doesn't really get across the immersion of, of, of virtual reality. So I think once we see stuff like the Vive and Oculus be available for people to consume content through, and what new media that generates, that I, I cannot wait for. Uh, but 
beyond that, I mean, the vibe is just something special. That's uh, that's hauntingly amazing. Um, but I, I still don't know, you know, because I, I think a lot of people have 3D TVs. I don't ever watch anything in 3D. So I don't know if I'm just going to end up buying one of these and then it just sits in a corner uh, like an Xbox One.
it's going to be more and more uh, language barriers, less so than geographic barriers. And for an event like this, biggest in the UK, let's get a load of virtual cameras and make it the biggest in the world. That'd be cool. I think that's, a, that's one of the really potentially exciting things about VR is it, it makes the world smaller. You know, the internet made the world smaller, and I like. You know, we were talking about like stats and stuff. One of the really cool things you can do with um, YouTube is find out where people are watching from. And um, I like to, you know, you get the big ones like big audience in America, big audience in the UK. I like to go to the other end and find out where like one person on the world in the world has watched one of our videos from Antarctica, which is amazing. I think some kind of like ice base, you know, frozen. And solid, and they're sitting there on the phone watching one of our terrible let's plays. Amazing, but like, yeah, it would be really cool to have you know some kind of 360 degree camera thing there and have like our you know all our subscribers, all our viewers live live streamed in. It would be amazing. I like that. Yeah, you can have like uh, two pack though, like the hologram. Wouldn't that be cool? Two pack up on stage talking about games. Why not make it happen? Any other questions? with a driving wheel and used the rear view mirror in Forza to make us basically look like we were driving a real car. Um, and it was ludicrous because we just had real fun with you know, the, the craziness of that. Um, and it's just the silly videos like that, I think, kind of stick in your mind. Uh, I think for me, my favorite video is uh, a cartoon that we did with these guys called Flash Kids. It's called Destiny Bro. Uh, which is kind of like a takedown of Destiny and Halo. And the reason it's my favourite is like that was the clip that started like things blowing up for us. You know, that was our first clip to jump two million views. Like if you look at our analytics kind of before and after, you know, you've got kind of spikes and this huge spike. And that's another thing when you grow your channel. Once you get spiked up like that, it's, you never go kind of lower than what it was before. So yeah, it means a lot to me because that was when things started getting serious and people started coming to us rather than us going to them with a, you know, a cap in hand, like, please, please work with us. Um, so, yeah. We've got uh, time for one more question. Hello. So, Mark, you actually mentioned uh, about animation. It would be interesting to see a streamed animation process. There's an indie dev, there's a Loon and Dare game jam. Um, and one of the top streamers of that will have you get on live streaming is amazing across all mediums and I think game development if you were developing a, a character and all of a sudden you found out I don't know maybe a, maybe you develop like a sniper and she's wearing no clothes but she breathes through her skin so it's okay and then actually people are like no that's still a bit no like you know surely she could just wear like a slightly less revealing outfit that sort of input early in the development process could be really useful um, so I, I, I would love to see more things like that. The, the crowd mind that's out there, the number of man hours we can have thinking over things on a shared thing like that. I think if Twitch can play Pokemon, having Twitch makes a game, or YouTube Gamer makes a game, uh, would be amazing. Uh, and I'd love to see the monstrosities that would come from it. Yeah, I think that's the great thing about uh, you know, engines like Unity and Unreal and things like that is you can build stuff really quickly, you can really rapidly prototype stuff, and having been to a couple of game jams, it's, it's fascinating to watch these things just sort of spring up from, from seemingly nowhere. So to kind of yeah, bring the interactivity of uh, a live stream to that process would be fascinating. So someone who's much smarter than me, please do that. Um, at a very small flight 
Wrestling Gaming Channel. Uh, can we see us at Pixels at Dawn? Um, what kind of, what would you want active piece of promotion with wrestling that you do outside of wrestling? similar channels that are slightly higher on the ladder than you and collaborate, expose yourself to their audiences, but you know, through gaming, not through exposing yourself. Um, and a lot of people think when they hear collaboration, they think, oh, okay, cool, I'll, I'll send an email to you know, the Yogg's Council, you guys like that. But it is just kind of gradually working your way up the ladder. You'll gain more respect and you'll be able to get through more doors once you are a larger entity yourself. Um, and that's all it is. If you're doing good stuff, you just need to try and shout as loud as you can to as many people. And once they watch it, they'll agree with you, I'm sure.